Okay, so we are beginning the discussions. Everybody here? So, Alışın yani bilim adamı olacak, hoca olacaksın sen seni. Yani fizik eğitimden mi? Yok sen fizik aldın. Sen işte bilim adamı olacaksın, seminerler vereceksin. So your friend has a question. Again the bus taking the curve. Hold this high. Hold this high. So, we are in a bus, autobus days. The bus is taking a right turn, right? Okay, so the bus will be moving in that direction, and it will take a right turn. So you all have this uh, this experience. There is a pole at the, in the front of the car, in, in front of the bus, just next to the door. Right there, this direi var bir tane. This is that pole, okay? So now, so what's the question? So she is holding the pole. So this is these are the walls of the. Okay, so hold on, hold on, hold on. So these are the walls of the door, the bus. Otobüsün duvarları bunlar. Okay, so these are the windows. So the the bus is turning right. So, so your experience, you are saying that as the bus is turning right, to hold yourself straight up, so what you should do is you just lean towards the bus, right? Is that what you mean? You you kind of lean towards the bus to be able to stand up without exerting much force on the pole. So the windows are now are not parallel to you, but they are a bit tilted. Now that's mainly because you are just standing like this. If the if the bus is just straight, you are standing like this, right? You are standing like this. Valla boyadınız diye zaten yollamıyorlar otobüs. Well, one thing we can do is we can just divide in groups and take a bus someday on a weekend, just in groups of ten, and we can discuss physics. Okay, so so this is what happens. You are the, you are go taking the bus. These are the walls. These are the windows, your friends. So the bus takes a right turn. So you, the the pole is over there. But if you don't want to hold the pole, or if you don't want to exert too much force on the wall, what you do is you just remove the force on your right leg. So you just go a bit towards the right. So you just see that your the windows are no longer parallel to me, but they're a bit tilted towards me. Yeah, of course. When, now, what happens is, okay, so the bus is turning right. So I'm kind of, rem uh, when the bus is turning right, the bus is also tilting itself. So the bus will be tilted a bit towards the outside. If you, if you look at the bus making a right turn, the bus does tilt a bit. It's no longer parallel to the ground. The bus does tilt. So if you are just standing right up, in order not to tilt with the bus, you have to shorten one side. You have to shorten one of your legs. So you remove the force, you are still standing up according to an outside observer. But the bus is no longer parallel, it is a bit tilted, so the walls are not straight anymore. So the walls are tilted towards me. So this is the, wall, this is the uh, window, so he is tilted towards me, so that's what I observe. Was that? So the question is, mass object with different mass, will they be hmm? Will they feel a different effect? 
when the car is turning, the bus is turning right or left? Will there will the effect on object of different mass will be different? Well, let's see. Well, you can be an object of uh, one mass. Uh, you can be uh, the object of another mass. Uh, do you know each other? Now take a bath together one day and tell us how much you feel the force, how much you have to lean to one side or the other side. My guess is that they will feel the same effect. Because what, what will happen? Okay, so let's say we are, I'm standing up. The bus is turning right. The force acting on me is the friction force, mainly. Now, if I'm not holding anything, there is a friction force. We know that the friction force depends on the normal force, which depends on my mass. So the friction force I will feel will depend on my mass. If I have a larger mass, I will feel a larger force. If I have a smaller mass, I will feel a smaller force. But the force necessary to change my direction is also proportional to my mass. So if I have a larger mass, I will be friction, I will be feeling a larger force, but I also need a larger force to make a shift. If I have a smaller mass, I will feel less friction, but I need a smaller force. So nothing will change. But if you are holding the pole, so that will be the significant portion of the force necessary. If you have a larger force, larger mass, you still need a larger force. Some of that force will come from your hand. And that force will be larger if you have a larger mass. So if he just uh, takes uh, some kind of a, this scale, the linear one with a spring, attaches to this pole and holds the other end of the, the scale. As the car turns around, turns right, the scale that he uses will measure a larger force than the scale that she uses because his mass is larger than her mass. Now take a car, take a bus. Of course, with that scale and hook over there, they will look, you will have some weird look. So you, you should sacrifice yourself for science. <laughs> yes, other questions? Yes, you, you had your question before the break. Okay. Well, I, I have two guesses. One is that so the orbits are planar. They the almost all the orbits in the solar of the planets in the solar system are in the same plane, except then Pluto. It has a different orbit. If you put a star over there, the distance of that star from the sun is much small if you put a star right at the top of the sun. That distance from the sun is smaller than the distance of that, that third star, second star from the planets. So the sun will feel a larger force, will feel a larger acceleration than the planets at that instant. So that will probably make a change, make a difference. But it also depends on how far away this star is. Because it is really far away, the force that the sun feels and the planets feel will not fe make any too much of a difference, so nothing will change. In that case, your simulation is wrong. Okay, any other questions about acceleration and the bus? Do you know the song, Wheels of the Bus Goes Round and Round? Okay. So you have a small brother or sister, right? No, I have a two-year-old kid, and she she loves that song. So whenever I think of bus, it's always this song. Sounding. 
Okay, any other questions? Now, I still would like to discuss one problem about gravity, and the gravity will be over. I will use the projector. Now, the problem is, it's a hypothetical, non-realistic case. We have, a, let's say, a spherical planet. Inside this planet, there is a spherical cave with no mass. What is the gravitational field inside this cave at an arbitrary point? Inside, inside this cave. Now, I have this sphere, spherical planet. Inside, I have an empty cave. And inside this, you are just sitting inside the cave. So what will be the gravitational force you feel uh, depending on where you are on this cave? Now, the so, sorry? No, why? At, it will never be zero, that is for sure. You see, there is always a force toward the center. There is mass between this point and the center of the whole thing, which will attract it towards the center so in this cavity. Now, it turns out that the gravitational force inside this cavity is homogeneous. It is independent of which at which point you are. Well, I like this example. It, it's definitely not a realistic case. You will never find a mass, spherical mass distribution with some cavity inside. But it is nice because you are all sticking to your habits from high school up to this point. Now, up to this point, all the problems we discussed, you could solve with what you have learned in high school. So there, I don't think we had discussed any problem that couldn't be solved with those techniques. And in high school, they taught you these techniques. And then once you know these techniques, all the questions that were selected, they were not, I mean, nature will just present you with random questions. There will be no selection there. But in schools, they just select questions to ask you which can be solved using those techniques only. And at the end, you just start feeling that, OK, these techniques are enough. So why learn different things? So that is why you are still not using vectors. Uh, that's my impression, at least. Now, this question of a spherical mass with some spherical cavity inside has a very simple solution. Let's go to the blackboard. Do not sit down. Go to the blackboard. Just make a circle close to the blackboard. Well, you could have erased the blackboard. So this is our question. We have this spherical mass distribution. Inside this spherical mass distribution, I just em empty the mass here. So there is mass over here and no mass over here. So the large sphere has the radius that's uh, denoted by R1. The small sphere has the radius R2. And let us just call this distance or this vector pointing from the center of the large sphere to the center of the smaller sphere by d. Mass density, let's just denote by some letter, rho. The question is, what is the gravitational force? If I put a mass um, at that point, what will be the force acting on it? The 
these are all spheres. The small sphere is a cave inside this planet. So the, that is the question. What is the gravitational attraction of the planet? How can we calculate it? The center of mass. So, well, it will not help because gravity, uh, look, we didn't prove, there is nothing that tells us that the gravitational force acts only between the center of masses. We proved that only for spheres. And if you don't have a sphere, it doesn't hold. Yes? Yes, exactly the point. I don't like that minus thing though. So if you have the full sphere, this is the full sphere. This is the mass that I carve out to, to get that case. Now my mass M is over here. Now in this case, I have a full sphere, not the empty case. The force that my mass M will feel the all of this force will be equal to the force created by all of this mass. Let's call it the force created by my original mass distribution, this one. Plus the force of this mass of the cave. I can calculate this one. We had already calculated. We know that if you have a mass over here, somewhere over here, at a distance, let's call it R1, small r1, then it only feels a force due to this mass over here, and nothing else. The total mass inside this sphere, let's say MR, the volume of that sphere, which is 4 pi over 3 r1 cubed times the mass density. So it will feel only an attraction due to this sphere. All the remaining mass will just create a net force which is equal to zero. Yes, good. At least one reaction. Now, if we have this shell, remember this is a spherical shell. We had proven that inside, well, I couldn't prove I had a mistake there. We, we should discuss that one too. We could had proven that if I take this spherical shell and put a point mass inside that spherical shell, then the net gravitational force felt by that mass will be zero. Because some mass will be pulling it toward that direction, some other mass will be pulling it toward the other direction. So this shell doesn't exert any, the mass in this shell doesn't exert any force on my mass over here. And all of this mass behaves as if this mass is located at the center. All of this mass is given by this, the volume times the density. So the force due to this one will be the magnitude Newton's constant, the mass that I put over there, this mass, 4 pi over 3 r1 cubed rho, divided by the distance from the center, squared, r1 squared. This is equal to gn, 4 pi over 3 m rho r1. This is the force. It is direction. Well, if I'm over here, this is my, let's say, this is my R1 vector. Now, the force is, will be in that direction, in the minus R1 hat direction. So force, gn, 4 pi over 3 m rho, in the minus R1 hat direction, R1, R1 hat. Any questions up to here? No. 
Let's look at this vector. R1 hat is a unit vector in the direction that R1 is pointing. R1 is the length of this R1 vector. This product is a vector that points in the direction of the R1 vector, and it has the magnitude of the R1 vector. So this is nothing but the R1 vector itself. So the force due to all of this sphere without the cavity, so this is the F is equal to 4 pi over 3 gn m rho r1. Any questions up to this point? Minus your right. Any other comments? Now, let's do the other case. Now, we have all this mass over here. So this is just a field sphere. This mass is at a distance r2 from the center. Well, it's identically the same problem. The only difference is that from relative to the center, the position of this mass is not given by the r1 vector, but by the r2 vector. So I could repeat the same calculation or just pick up this result. So the force created by the mass that you, that was in the cavity is equal to 4 pi over 3 gn m rho r2 vector. Now the mass density of the small sphere and the mass density of the large sphere, they are identical. Mass is the test mass that I am using. Newton's constant is the same. 4 pi over 3 is the same. So the only thing that changes when I go from the large sphere to the small sphere is this vector R1. So the, this was the force of the original system. By the way, just a repetition. I'm not putting these vector signs or, I don't know, these vector signs over there just for uh, decoration purposes. Bunlar süs değil, vektör işareti dedi vesaire vesaire ya da şurada çizdiğim şeyler. Bunlar sizden beklediğim şeyler. You are supposed to put these vector signs in correct places. And if you write something like this, this is again wrong. This is a magnitude, this is a number. This is a vector, if you put that vector sign. So the magnitude of, in the quiz, the magnitude of the tension, the, the force acting on my mass should be equal to this one. Now, let's come back here. The force created by my original system is equal to F minus FC. Well, I have to subtract this one from this one. Here I have a minus sign. Well, they, are, they have the same coefficient. Minus 4 pi over 3 gn m rho. It is just R1 minus R2. So we have time. Okay. So let's come here. No, I wanted to look at the time. Let's come here. What is that R1 minus R2 vector? So how do we add vectors? How do we subtract vectors? So this is the vector A. This is the vector B. Now A minus B is nothing but A plus minus B. So I minus B vector is almost identical to the B vector, but it points in the opposite direction. So this is the minus B vector. So if I want to subtract B from A, I just take minus B, and to this minus B, I add the A vector. So I start from the end point of B. Mi this is minus B vector plus the A vector. I reach here. So A minus B is nothing but this vector over here. <coughs> this is A minus B. So it starts from the end of the vector that I'm subtracting, ends at the vector that I'm subtracting from. Okay, I need there R1 minus R2. This is my R1 vector. This is my R2 vector minus R2. Just change the sign direction. This is the minus R2 vector 
So I go R1, along R1, then I go in the inverse direction of R2, I reach this point, no matter where I am. So this is the point I reach, whether I take this point or this point. But this vector over here is nothing but the D vector. So this is what I have. So what depends on the position of my mass? So does 4 pi depend on the position of my mass? Dn, m, rho, d. What is d? What is? It is the vector between the centers, right? So it doesn't depend on where I put my mass. Why, why? Okay, so, good, good question. You should always ask yourself. This answer tells us that the gravitational force inside this sphere is uniform. It is independent of where you are. So this is also an example where the gravitational force doesn't necessarily point toward the center of mass. If you have this mass over here, so this is our gravitational field. This is how we usually denote it. Well, the direction of these lines just show which direction the force points to, and the density gives me the magnitude. So they are just uh, equal density. So if I put a mass over here, the force it will feel will be in this direction. If I put some mass over here, the same mass over here, it will feel a force in this direction, parallel to the, this point. So these two forces do not point towards a single point. So this is also one, an example where we can actually calculate the gravitational force, and the gravitational force of a mass distribution doesn't point toward the center of mass. Elde ettiğimiz kuvvet homojen. Nerede koyarsanız koyun kütleyi, kuvvet hep aynı yöne gidecek. So it da, kuvvet ve kuvvet tek bir noktaya doğru gitmeyecek. Noktasal yüklerde birbirinin ne doğruydu? Ama burada tek bir noktaya doğru gitmiyor. Hepsi son, son, aynı yöne gösteriyor. Tek bir noktada birleşmiyor. Yes. Why? Well, I don't know. I don't have a simple answer to this one. I can, the calculation is not that complicated once you get used to the vectors. Why? I don't know. I can say that, okay, maybe if you, if you are at this point, I don't know. I don't have a simple answer. Yes. So let's, let's look at this solution. Did we make any assumption about these R1 and R2 vectors? So nothing changes. Or is that true? No, hold on, hold on. So we didn't make any assumption about where these points are, R how, about the size of this cave and the planet. Well, then we can make a uh, limiting cases. Does it make sense? We can just imagine that I have my planet, and the cave has the center, which is also the center of my planet. I have a cave at the center of my planet. So this tells me that the gravitational field inside this cave should be uniform. Is it true? Why? What we calculated the, we did calculate the gravitational field of a shell. Well, this is a shell, and we are looking at a point inside the shell, and we obtained the gravitational field, which was. Well, there is one answer zero. Bir kabuğun küresel bir kabuğun içerisindeki kütle çekim kuvveti ne kadardı hesapladık? 
You can cheat from him. Okay, from here, fine, but we don't want to use this result. <laughs> to obtain that result, remember, we had said that the gravitational field, the gravitational force to this mass is only due to the mass inside the sphere. The shell, since I'm inside the shell, the net gravitational attraction created by this shell inside it is zero. And zero is a uniform number. Inside this shell, the gravitational field is zero, well, which is uniform. It's a uniform number. So that result holds for this case too. I could have imagined a spherical shape which covers almost all the mass. And it would still hold. And also, yeah, let's look at this case and this case. No, hold on, hold on. Remember your question. Let's cons compare this case and this case. Here I have all this mass, but here I have a very small mass. When I look at my result, it only depends on the density, it seems. I have a very small mass, which has the same density as this very large amount of mass. So does that mean that the force inside this cave and that cave are the same? How does this change of mass reflect in that equation? One minute. I can take even the other extreme case, that the cave can cover the whole planet. So there is no planet, almost no planet. But that expression should still hold. It does. How does it hold? So what happens to D? The magnitude of D in this case is much smaller than the magnitude of D here. It has to be smaller. In the other extreme one, this is the planet and this is the cave. The D is almost zero. So there is almost no gravity. So although if you just look at this coefficient over here, You might think that the gravity doesn't depend on the size of the cave. The size of the cave would affect this constant over here, this vector over here. If D contains information about the size of the cave. Because if the cave is large, the center of the cave is, should be close to the center of the planet. Does it make sense? Yes, it doesn't make sense. Positive? It's pointing in the opposite direction. Meaning that well, I'm calculating the force created by this mass over here on the test mass I put over there. The force will be pointing in this direction where I define the R2 vector pointing in the opposite direction. So that's why I, well, for vectors, you cannot really say that they are positive or negative. It just means this just this minus sign doesn't tell me that the force is negative. It doesn't have any meaning. This tells me that the force is in the opposite direction of the R2 vector. Vector there is positive or negative diye bir şey söyleyemez. Sadece yönüyle ilgili bir şey söyleyebiliriz. Orada da bana söylediği kuvvetin R2 vektörünün zıt yönünde oldu oradaki negatif işareti. You had a question, no? Right? So. This one. This one. No. If I put it over here, it also will not move. Or if I put it here, it will not move. It feels zero force. Well, what happens is, okay, it is just, because here it will feel a force. Here, it, because here the center of this cave doesn't coincide with the center of the whole sphere. Here they do coincide. 
So that is why in this example, well, this example is a spherical shell. So inside the spherical shell, the net gravitational force is zero. This is not a spherical shell. So in this here, what happens is, if I put some mass over here, just imagine, just draw a line that goes through that point. Now there's all this mass appearing over there, and all this mass appearing on the other side. All of this mass will create a force in this direction. All of this mass will create a force in the other direction. And it turns out that these two forces have same magnitude. So they just cancel each other, whether you are here or here. Let me just com first compare it with this example. There we have this planet and we have the cave. Okay, I have put my mass over there. If I try to repeat the same thing, okay, there is this mass. I can just say, okay, there is all this mass here, which will more or less cancel this force over here. The force created by this mass will be canceled by the force created by this mass over here. But there is all the remaining mass, which will create a force toward the center. Now, your other question. Yes. Ask it in Turkish. The planet. Of course, the planet will not hold that force if it's a big enough planet. And in none of the planets that we know, you have such a big uh, caves inside the planet. It's al al always filled. Well, that's why the planets have spherical shapes, by the way. So, no, that, that's an interesting thing, by the way. The planets, why do planets have spherical shapes, but asteroids do not have spherical shapes? Because of mass. Because the mass, the gravitational, the gravitational attraction is so large that it just attracts all the mass to a closest distance possible, which is a spherical shape. But for asteroids, the, the force is not enough. So it doesn't break the solid. It cannot break the solid to form a spherical shape. Yeah. So that such a planet doesn't exist. OK. 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 And you, and you just put a man over there. He will fly. Yes. He will not fall in toward the center. No, what do you mean? Uh, you mean like this one? We have the planet. We just create a cave which is not centered at the center. This one. Well, this is this problem over here. The force that you will feel inside this cave will be proportional to the vector pointing the cent from the center of the larger exterior sphere to the center of the interior sphere. So this will be the d vector. And the force that you will feel will be given by this one. It will not be 0. Evet. Now, the question is, if you look at this thing, so he's just making an interpretation of this result. If you look at this picture, we have a sm I have a smaller mass here in this side. But that mass, on the average, is closer to this point. Well, a larger mass means a larger gravitational attraction. Well, a smaller mass means smaller gravitational attraction. But the smaller distance means larger gravitational attraction. So there are these two effects. The smaller mass tries to decrease the force. The larger, the, the smaller distance tries to increase the force. On the other hand, if you look at all this mass, you have much more mass here. But on the average, this mass is further away. So here you have a larger mass, but a larger distance. 
So larger mass will try to increase the gravitational force, the larger distance will try to decrease it. These two effects just ba balance each other so that although I have less mass here than here, since the distance is less here than here, the two forces created by these two parts will be equal. Okay. Are you sure? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. No? Why should I? Well, one problem is, which distance are you talking about here? Are you talking about the distance of this point from here, or the distance from here, or the distance from here? You have to talk about some average distance, let's say. In fact, the average of 1 over r squared, which will be more relevant for to me. You have to define some kind of an average. There is no center. I mean, I don't. Why should I care about the centers? No, I am sure about that because my calculation shows that the forces can should cancel. The net force is zero. That already tells me that the force from here cancels the force over here. Now, of course, to cal to show that cancellation, I didn't you really you calculate the force due to this part and the force due to this part. I didn't use that information. Which, well, that would make a nice homework question. Hmm? Okay. Well, after your exams, you you are have you will be having, well, not this weekend, but the following weekend you have the exam for this course. The following weekend you have the exam for calculus courses. Well, I will add this as a bonus. And you don't have to do it. I will just tell you which steps you should carry out. Now, before we go on, I, I also would like to discuss what was my mistake in the derivation I did the last lecture. Remember when we were trying to prove that the spherical shell doesn't create any force inside itself? I couldn't drive it. You remember that? I had the slides, but I couldn't drive it. Now, the mistake I had was, I had I considered this shell, a very thin shell. I divided it into very small segments. And I then assumed that this decay was constant. Now, that was my mistake. I should not divide this into small rings with constant decay. Now, the problem with that division is that if I take the last bit over here, Remember, what we did was I just sliced it with constant decay and I opened it up. But if I take this last bit and there is nothing to open up, it's a, di it's a disk, it is no longer a ring. That is where I failed. What I should have done was I should have taken these lengths to be constant. So, well, this is my angle theta. And I just take this d theta to be constant. So if I if I take that d theta is constant, this arc has the length r d theta, r being the radius. If I take a a ring very close to the edge, the ring will just look like this. Now even if I take it very close to the edge, this will be my ring, and then I just cut it up, open it up then it becomes a rectangle. Otherwise, for constant decay, if I take this ring, it just looks like this. It's no longer a rectangle when I open it up. That is where I failed. If you correct this, then all those complicated expressions for decay in terms of L, they just cancel. Uh, I will not be doing it. Your friends are waiting for the class. Did we run out of time? Yes, we have five minutes left. Now we will continue like this.